All right, hey guys. Hope you're all doing well. Today I want to talk about de-googling, but doing that with Graphene OS. Now, just count of hands, how many of you have heard of or have participated in de-googling yourself? Okay, that's pretty awesome. How many of you know about Graphene OS specifically? All right, all right, we got a pretty good Graphene OS crowd here. So, why would you want to de-google? Most Android phones come baked in with Google services. These Google services include the Play Store, Google Services Framework, and the Google Play services. From now on, I'm going to refer to all three of those just as Play services. Some of these services run highly privileged in like a privileged SE Linux domain, which allows them special access to certain information and identifiers that normal apps normally cannot get, like device serial number, IMEI, IMSI. Google even uses these services to constantly collect telemetry and data mine your device even when you aren't using it. Google's Android is proprietary, and while you can disable most of the built-in Google apps, you can't remove them. And by disabling them, you're going to be breaking a bunch of stuff, and your system will start throwing errors. What is AOSP? So AOSP is the Android open source project. It is the base Android template that every other version of Android uses. Even Google's own proprietary Android that is pre-installed on the Pixel phones uses AOSP. Now, AOSP is primarily designed by Google. However, it is an entirely open source project, and other people, other groups, other companies can take that and turn it into something they want. So, for instance, Lineage OS, Google's own proprietary version of Android with all their features, Graphene OS, and then something like Samsung One UI. Those are all based around AOSP. Some of them have just been more modified than others. And what is Graphene OS? Graphene OS is a security-hardened custom version of AOSP that adds various privacy and security features. It does not include any invasive proprietary Google apps or services, but allows using Google services through a sandbox compatibility layer if necessary. It has a hard app runtime, libc, malloc, kernel, se Linux policy, and it stays up to date with Android security patches, often releasing patches the day they come out, and sometimes even before Google pushes them. Security patches will be on Graphene OS. And it is as open source as possible. So that's most of the operating system. Sometimes there's drivers or firmware that's proprietary, but they have made it to be as open source as they could do. So Graphene OS has a ton of features, and this is just this is honestly a short list of them. It's got all those hardened features that I mentioned in the last slide. It's got enhanced verified boot. It's got a network and sensors runtime permission toggles. It's got storage scopes. It's got sandbox Google Play services. It's got secure app spawning. It's got Mac randomization. It's got an auditor app for local and remote attestation. And it's got custom hardened apps, including a hardened camera, a hardened version of Chromium called Vanadium, and a hardened PDF viewer. So the first, the first one I want to show you is the network permissions toggle. So let me see if I can actually get this to show up here. Let's see. So I have images, but I wanted to see if I could actually do this uh, live. There we go. So I have a Pixel 5 here running Graphene OS. And let's say that I installed some app, like some Note app that I like. But it's proprietary, and it might seem a little sketchy, and it wants to have network access. On regular Android, there is no way to revoke that app from having network access. If it wants network access, it gets it. But on Graphene OS, I can just go into the app info by holding on the app, typing app info. I can go to permissions, network, don't allow. And now, just like that, it has no, it has no network access. There's a cache. That's a cache site. There we go. Oh, see, it's still caching that site. If I, go to, if I try to go to google.com, it shouldn't work. Yep. Continue to site. It doesn't have network access, but if I go back and toggle it again, it'll have internet. And open. And there it is. This is extremely powerful because... The just, just purely honestly for the fact that it's not available on regular Android, the fact that you cannot choose what apps get network access or not. And this completely disables all network access. It's not just internet, but even local network access. It doesn't get any of that. And another one that's really awesome is the sensors permission. So most apps, 
by default on Android, get sensor permission. This is just part of the OS. But most apps don't need this. And you'll be able to tell if an app is trying to use sensors. Because on Graphene OS, if you have disabled the sensors permission, it'll tell you, hey, this app is trying to use sensors. And I've noticed that for so many apps that have no reason to use sensors whatsoever. They will be constantly trying to access your sensors. And it'll give you a notification, hey, you can disable that if you want. But it's really cool to see uh, this in action, the fact that you can disable this also. And the fact that so many apps are trying to use that when they don't need it. And so you can just flat out refuse to give them that permission also. Uh, and one thing I want to I want to show with the the network permission is that it is it is requested on app installation. I don't know if the internet is going to work. It's a little slow. But if I were to go into and install like this time planner app from F Droid. Oh, see that one doesn't even request network permissions. So that one doesn't even ask me. Let's see a different one here. Uh, let's do pipe pipe. There, see. It asks me before I even install the app if I want to give it network permission. So I can revoke before it even gets installed its network permission. And there is a way for sensors uh, permission to automatically prevent apps from getting that by default. Allow sensors, there it is. In the settings, allow sensors permission to apps by default. That is on because that's just the way Android works, but you can turn this off and apps will not get the sensors permission by default. This could break some things for some apps, like Maps apps, they need that, obviously. But most apps do not need the sensors permission. Oh. So storage copes. This one is super cool and probably the most impressive uh, user interfacing feature on Graphene OS. Some apps require access to all your files, even if you only want to use a single file or photo for that app. Storage scopes allow you to control what files or images that app gets, even if that app requires the photos and videos or music and audio permissions that would normally give them all of that. It used to be just a standard files permission in Android, but they've kind of broken it down a little bit, so you have a separate photos and videos and music and audio, but that still gives them all of that file type. So let's say I have a gallery app. I just installed this one, Aves. This is also on F-Droid. I recommend this gallery app. Um, let's go continue. So when an app requests to see all your photos and videos, you can press Allow, or you can go ahead and tap Set Up Storage Scopes. You can enable this, and now you can choose what files, folders, or photos to pass onto that app. So I can go ahead and add an image here. I've got these beautiful images of Tux the Penguin. Uh, so I can choose this one of him drinking out of a Windows juice box. Add. And now I can go back. And that's it. That's the only image this has now. It only has that one that I selected. And uh, this is really useful because Android does have built-in interfaces for apps to, to have only specific files or photos passed through to it. But a lot of apps don't support that. They want permission to see all of your files, all of your photos, especially a lot of proprietary apps like Microsoft Teams notorious for that. So this allows you, uh, regardless of what the app wants, it tricks the app into thinking that it has full access when really it doesn't. And, the, and this is like super powerful to prevent uh, unnecessary leakage of your data to whatever company for app you're using. And uh, they just recently added a feature very similar to contact scopes called, or s very similar to storage scopes called contact scopes that does the exact same thing but with your contacts. So if I have uh, let's see, I have this contact apps I just installed here. So instead of set up storage scopes, we have set up contact scopes. And this allows you to pass through only specific contacts to that app. So if you have certain sets of contacts you want for different purposes and you don't want all of your apps to be able to have all of your contacts, you can give it access to only those contacts. And so you can have, let's say you have a label, you have one label for work, one label for personal. You could give that app just all the contacts that only have the label for work. You can see that there. I don't currently have a label. I didn't set that up on this. But I can create like one called work. I can add a contact to this. Tux the penguin is now in work. And now I can add that label, work. Add to list of scopes. And now it's got all the ones, or it should. There we go, there's Tux the penguin. And not only can you just do like label and specific contacts, but you can also do 
Uh, you can add just their number or just their email, so you have a bit of granularity for what you want to add. Now, this feature, unfortunately, does not allow, it does not allow writing of contacts, but it does allow you to specifically choose what ca contacts you want to read. Oh, yeah, that was the same slide. There we go. So next, I want to show you uh, Sandbox Google Play services. Now, I probably should have installed this before doing this because it's kind of big. So unfortunately, a lot of apps on Android, because of how Google has built this into the ecosystem, and even other versions of Android that are based off of AOSP still include the Google services like Samsung and um, Xiaomi uh, and Huawei. All their, all their Android distros still include the Google Play services. And because of that, a lot of apps are reliant on them. Usually for notification support, they'll usually work, but you will not get notifications unless you have the Play services installed. So on Graphene OS, you can basically install a sandbox version of the Google Play services, and it tricks the Play services into running under the sandbox without having this highly privileged access that they normally would get. And you can do this right from the app, apps app. It's co literally called apps on Graphene OS. And if you go into Google Play Services and you tap Install, it'll install all of these components here. And I can even revoke network permission for these on the fly if I want to. Install Play Store, install Play Services. And now it's going to install all of those and basically give me the whole Play Services package and even some Google features that you normally wouldn't get on Graphene OS. I'm going to wait for that to install. The next one here. Auto reboot. This feature is awesome because before your phone is first unlocked, which is first unlocked meaning after reboot or startup, your profile and all its contents are encrypted at rest. What this means is that somebody can't attempt to extract your information or do forensics on the memory of the phone for any meaningful information that would be in your profile for like apps you have running. Because when your phone's rebooted, no apps are running, your entire profile is encrypted. It doesn't get unencrypted until you first put in your pen for the first time. So essentially, what the auto reboot does, you can set a timer so that if you are unactive on your phone, if you have not unlocked your phone for a certain period of time, it will automatically reboot and put your phone back into that fully encrypted at rest state. And so if you're in a situation where you think, or like your phone gets taken away from you, like someone steals your phone, something ha you lose your phone, something happens, you can be rest assured that your phone will be rebooted and that all of your information will be back to that encrypted state. So it, pre it doesn't completely prevent somebody from potentially getting information, but it highly inhibits their ability to try and get any, do any forensics on the device to steal any information from you. No, no, you won't. Uh, so there are only a, a very small handset of apps that can give you notifications after a reboot. It's only so certain apps that are built into the operating system. So for instance, the clock app. If your phone restarts, it can still send an alarm if it has to. And I believe the phone app still can receive calls, but any third-party app that you install after a reboot, it can't run until you unlock your first profile. Uh, and then compatibility. See if I can move this out of the way here. That's still installing. It takes a while to install. So this is a common thing that I see people talk about is compatibility with Graphene OS. They're either worried apps won't work or they've heard, ah, I can't do so much stuff on this. Now, that used to be the case to an extent where a lot of apps just didn't really work on Graphene OS or didn't have great compatibility with certain things. But that has changed a lot uh, just from the fact of the OS being upgraded and the fact that we have the Sandbox Google Play services now, that benefits greatly. So a lot of bank apps that normally wouldn't work without Play services, they do work now. And I have a link here uh, that has a really cool list of like a giant list of bank apps that do work because bank apps are the primary one that usually if you don't have some specific Google services or if you can't pass safety net properly, it'll just not run. It'll just crash on startup. So this is a, on a list that somebody created that has a, just a giant curated list of bank apps for like several countries uh, that do work on Graphene OS. Required hardware. So Graphene OS requires a Google Pixel, ironically, uh, because of its more open hardware design. 
Because uh, Google is the primary developer of Android, they make the reference hardware for it, for other developers to test out their own versions of Android. It allows using a custom operating system while still locking the bootloader, which almost no other phone lets you do that. The recommended Pixel to get is a Pixel that comes with, a tens with the Tensor hardware, which is one of their newer phones, which starts at the Pixel 6 or greater. If you want the longest support for security updates, buy the latest device, which is currently a Pixel 7. It has to be factory unlocked. It has to be factory unlocked. Don't buy carrier versions as you may end up with a locked bootloader with no way to flash graphene OS. Now, in some cases, you can get like a T-Mobile or an AT&T one that will still let you unlock the bootloader, but there's a chance that you're going to have some issues. Never buy Verizon ones. Verizon has always been hostile toward people trying to unlock the bootloader. Just don't, just don't bother. If you're going to buy one, just avoid the hassle. Get one that was unlocked from the factory. And if you want to do this without having to go to Google, you can, you can get factory unlocked ones at places like Best Buy or just get a used one on eBay or locally. Yeah, and if you, if you want to buy one anonymously, just don't buy one new. Because if you do buy one through Google that is factory unlocked, they will tie your, your name, credit card, all that into the serial number. All the information is kept together. How to install. This part may sound scary. Because a lot of people like, ah, this, this is hard. This is too scary. I don't want to install an operating system on my phone. But this is actually super, super easy. Graphene OS makes this as easy as possible. And honestly, it's the most easy custom ROM to install. Just a few things you have to watch out for. Make sure you're using a compatible operating system, which is Windows, Linux, Mac OS, or even Android. So you, that's fine there. Using a compatible browser, this one trips people up a lot because they'll try installing it using something like Firefox. Unfortunately, Firefox isn't supported. It requires a Chromium-based browser, at the very least, to use the interface that's required to do the debug bridge for Android. So, yes, Brave. Yep, I use Brave. Brave, Chrome, and Vanadium are three officially supported Chromium browsers. And using the right cable, this one too. Uh, I highly recommend not even just a high quality cable, but just using the OEM cable that came with your phone. So like the white one that comes in the box because I've had so many, I've had countless issues of trying to flash a phone at various times using different cables, even high quality ones that are designed for like an NVMe enclosure. And at some point it fails and I'm just, I keep doing it. I'm trying to figure out why I'm like, okay, I'll just try the OEM cable and it works. So I recommend just sticking to the OEM cable because cables are super weird. If you do this one, you shouldn't have any issues. And of course, follow the directions. If you, if you do everything in order and you do everything correctly, you should be fine. I see a lot of people all the time on support uh, asking questions when they just simply didn't follow the, the, the directions correctly. Uh, so if you go to Graphene OS and you click on install and you click on web USB based installer here, uh, it's got everything you need right here. And it might look like a lot, but it's really not. It's not too bad. Uh, this is just the prerequisites like I covered some of before. You have to do the enable OEM unlocking, which I can actually show you on this Pixel 5 here. So if I go to, oh, yep, and there's the play services. If I go to settings. Hmm, oh, thank you. <laughs> there we go. So if I go to the settings and I go to system, and if you have, haven't done this already, you need to enable developer mode. So go to about and you tap on the build number 10 times, it says I'm already a developer. Go back, go to system, go to developer options. And, and you needed to toggle that enable OEM unlocking. That's already on for mine, because I just installed Graphene OS on it. But you need to toggle that, and you will have to reboot. And once you do that, you need to get your phone into the bootloader interface, which you hold down the power button, you restart. And on most phones, you hold the volume down button. That'll get into the bootloader interface. And then you connect the phone. And then the next thing you do, you just follow what this tells you. You just press these buttons, and it will connect to your phone and start doing what it needs to do. These are grayed out right now because I'm using Firefox. Uh, unfortunately, I can't demo this because it requires to download the, the whole release, which is kind of big. But once you, once you do that, you can install it. You can go through. And then you can lock the bootloader back and make sure you lock the bootloader again. It will work without locking the bootloader, but by doing that, it allows someone else to modify your OS image or reflash if they want to. So that's that's the gist of the installation. It's extremely it's extremely easy. Uh, you just have to watch out for some of the the weird things like watt cables and specific browsers to use. But now I can go back and I can show you the. So we've got, oh yeah, there we go. There's the sensors permission working. Google Play services, try to access sensors. If you look at that. 
uh, and I can either tap to ask for permission, I cannot allow, or I can just turn those off by pressing the do not show next time button. So I've got play services installed now. And if I go to settings here, you can see by default it only gets network, which I allowed it on install. Uh, Google services framework also, I believe, only gets network. Let's go back. There we go. Yep, that one only gets network. And the Play Store also, I believe, only gets network. And that's all they need to work. They don't need every other permission. They don't need, like, you can give it access to other things if you're trying to use some other Google features. Uh, not, not all the Google features work. Some of them do. But by default, they only get network. And that's all they need just to, to work for notifications. But now, under Settings, if you go to Apps, you got this new section called Sandbox Google Play. And this takes you to that Google interface. Yeah, Google Settings. There we go. This takes you to that Google page that you would normally have on regular Android in your Pixel, where you can, if you want to, you can sign into your Google account. You've got all of your other stuff, like Find My Device, uh, set up and restore. You've got all that there, and most of that works. It just doesn't come with Graphene OS by default. So if you're someone that's trying to move over, but you're having trouble getting off of the Google platform, you still need some of that stuff, you can still use Google with your account and all the Google apps on Graphene OS. It is supported, and it doesn't necessarily take away from all the enhancements of Graphene OS. I mean, it's still optimal to not use those, but it still lets you use Google stuff, but in a more secure and private way. So I think that is, I think that is about all the slides I have. Where'd it go? Yeah, and that was that was that was pretty much it. Since you're going away from the Google's operating system to Graphene OS, what's your app store, and uh, where do you get all your apps that you're using? Yes, so. I use Ftroid to get most of my apps. Ftroid is a, in, in like a FOSS only app store, basically. And the one I use for this, I don't use the official Ftroid app because it's pretty out of date and has some security issues. But I use Neo Store, which you can get from their GitHub page. I think I have it. There it is. Oh, <laughs> thank you. He's trying to keep it private, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there we go. Uh, so on GitHub, it's called Neo Store. I use this one. It's great. It's awesome. It works well. And you can add all of your repositories. It comes with a few enabled by default. Uh, so by default, it comes with the F-Droid, the Guardian Project, and the Easy Android repositories. But it's got some others there that you can select to use. So if you wanted to use Bromite or if you wanted the Calyx OS repos, you can use those. And of course, you can add your own. Like it's, There's a lot that's there. Uh, but I like this because it's a, it's a really polished app, and it can actually auto-update your apps. That's something that historically has not worked for any F-Droid app, but this one will actually auto-update your apps without you having to go in and manually update all of them, which is super helpful. It saves a lot of time. And then the other one is Aurora Droid, or sorry, Aurora Store. So that is basically a proxy for the Play Store that lets you download Google Apps from the Play Store. So if you need, if you need some proprietary apps, which, I mean, everyone probably uses at least one proprietary app, if we're being honest. You can get that from Aurora Store and use one of their anonymous accounts without having to use the Play Store and signing into your own Google account. What's your uh, battery life usage versus stock versus graphing? So that's hard for me to say because when I first got a Pixel, the first thing I did was Graphene OS. So I actually... I used it stock for a very short amount of time, but I didn't look into that. But I can say that it's fine, and from everyone that I've heard that have switched over, it's usually better than stock. And it's at least not worse, that's for sure. But especially if, you do, if you're not using the Play services, it'll be better than stock, most likely. Does the, sorry, do the apps uh, get the real sensor data all the time, or is there any way to spoof sensor data? Not that I know of. Doing something like that would probably require root, which I, I which you can technically root Graphene OS. I don't recommend it uh, because the whole point of it is like security, having things locked down. And by rooting, you're opening up a giant security hole. So I, that's not something I know of that you can do. How does Neo Store do the auto updates? Does it have an agent that runs? Obviously, it's not running as root. No, so it's using a built-in Android API that allows a... So once you install 
an app from NeoStore, that app gets tagged as being like owned by NeoStore, and NeoStore is allowed to, per the Android permissions, it is allowed to automatically update it in the background. And you can, if you don't want NeoStore to do that, you can, you can turn that off. But every so often, like usually once a day, it'll boot up in the background, it'll check for updates, and it'll update stuff if there are. Are you saying if you install some apps from like uh, Play Store and they're also on Neo Store? So if you want if you want Neo Store to own, you don't have to reinstall them. But next time there is an update for that app, you want to go in and you want to update it from FDroid or from Neo Store, and then from there on that app will be tagged as being from Neo Store. And this is safe because it's not going to let you install an update unless it's, a it's got the same hashes as the current app you have installed. So if you're getting an app from the, the Play Store and from F-Droid, and if it lets you update them like both, that means it's, it is the same app. What do you do about data backup and when you get a new phone moving your apps and data? That's a really good one. I had somebody ask me about that yesterday. That is definitely a little bit of a challenge because most people are used to, um, most people are used to being able to just get a new phone and like all your stuff moves over, whether you're in an, on iPhone, iCloud, it just pulls down like all of your apps, all your information, all that. Or even with pixels with Google Android, there's, it's very easy to just move all of your stuff over. It just syncs from your Google account. So if you're going from something like stock Android to Graphene OS, there's a little bit of a challenge. Anything that is synced to your Google account, you will want to pull that down locally if you can usually from your Google account on the website. Like you can download your contacts, you can, uh, you can download like your emails and stuff like that and you can, you can add that locally if you want. Um, I am working on a migration guide since there doesn't seem to be like any like big one that I've seen. I'm working on a migration guide for something like that. I don't have it out yet. So if somebody is interested in moving over, I'll have something like that ready soon. But anything like your pictures, your documents, you're going to also pull those off onto a computer locally, most likely. Uh, and then files. And then anything specific for apps. So like any app that has data that needs to be backed up. So like if you use Signal, you need to back up your Signal information and put that somewhere. Now, I don't think Signal lets you back that up to the cloud anyway. But if you use something like, like a Notes app, you need, you need to export all your notes put that on your computer, and then when you flash Graphene OS, you need to take that off your computer, put it, put it back in your phone. And that's the same case if you're going from one Graphene OS phone to another. You have to kind of do a bunch of manual work, taking everything out and then putting it on the new one, which is a little bit of a downside, but that's just one of the, the things you have to do if you want to avoid using these centralized syncing stuff. I guess that's a good opportunity to like evaluate all the stuff you're using and see if you can remove any. Um, I, my question was, does Aurora Store do the same thing as Neo Store, where it, it can auto-update from Google Play? Yes. Yep, it does. It does do that. And in fact, Aurora Store uh, is less annoying because it, it like had done that from the beginning, and we're just now getting F-Droid stores that do that. But yeah, it, it works. I usually don't have to mess with it too much. Now, Aurora Store can be unreliable sometimes, and this is the one caveat. Uh, like recently, they had an issue where nobody could sign into Aurora Store using one of their anonymous accounts. They patched it and it works now. So that's the only one thing to be aware of is that there'll be times where Aurora Store probably just won't work or it's really, really slow, and you'll just have to try another time. I know you mentioned the uh, page with the banking apps. Is there like a broader page like, you know, uh, ProtonDB for Proton Games? You can see what runs and users can give reviews. Is there a page like that for Graphene that shows like what apps work and then if there's an update that breaks it? You just can or to use like the app store? Yes. Uh, there is a page like that. I'm trying to remember what it was called. Um, it's been a while since I've seen that. I think if someone knows what it's called, they can say it. I don't remember what it's called. I had several diff different versions of the original Pine Phone and was looking at getting a Pine Phone Pro. Is this something that might at some point be useful on the PinePhone Pro? 
that old Graphene OS will, is never going to work on the Pine Phone Pro, most likely, just because it uses the Google Pixel for a specific reason. I know it is Google, but the Google Pixel has the, the best open security hardware uh, than any, f like the Pine Phone, as far as I know, it doesn't really have like a, a security chip or anything like that. It can use for like things like device authentication and encryption keys and stuff. And Graphene OS wants to best utilize the available security hardware for something like that. And I know the Pine Phone Pro, it's a Linux phone, right? I don't know if it runs Android, it probably does. Uh, but that's, that's the main reason why they only support the Pixels, because it's open. Most other phones, even if they were okay in terms of security, like for instance Samsung, Samsung is extremely hostile towards you being able to unlock the bootloader. Like, you have to get a very specific version, and even then, if you can install a custom like ROM on it, you're not going to be able to relock the bootloader without breaking it. So, do you have any experience with Authenticator? Um, so when I moved from non like a non Google to a Pixel, so from I, I had an Honor phone and I moved to a Pixel, and even though I used like the import function, the numbers were actually off, and it wasn't an issue of the timing. It was like at some some of the providers, especially the secure ones. Um, ended up having, I actually had to go back and do a like walk through the reset process because the codes no longer worked in Authenticator. Have you heard anything about problems porting uh, Authenticator over into Graphene? I'm not sure. I've not used, is that a, just a 2FA app? I have not used that one. The one I use is called Aegis or Aegis. It's A-E-G-I-S. I really like that one. It will automatically do a, an encrypted backup every time you make a change of your vault to a file. But you got to make sure, of course, to manually back that up. And there are some ways, if you want to be able to have all of your stuff on your phone being backed up, like just the files itself, it's really hard to back up apps and their data. But if you have like photos and files and stuff, if you want that to be backed up, there are some open ways to do that. You can use something called SyncThing, which is like a serverless uh, syncing app that lets you sync your files between multiple devices and it can keep them encrypted if you want. And if you host a Nextcloud server, it's really easy to set up the Nextcloud app to have Nextcloud automatically sync your files, like your photos or images or all that to your server. And that uh, also could be used as a way to migrate instead of having to put everything locally on your computer. If you already have all of your files backed up to your sync thing or your Nextcloud, that, that could be a really easy way to migrate over. Yeah, you have to, unfortunately, you have to do most of that manually. Now, Graphene OS does have a, a backup feature built in under system backup. It does have this feature built in, and it has like a 12-word a uh, C that you have to save. Oh, yeah, it makes me, yeah, <laughs> makes me verify it manually. Uh, but this lets you essentially back up the apps, and it'll re-import them when you put the backup back in. However, this feature, they don't exactly recommend you to use it because it's kind of in a broken state, and they'll, they'll tell you that themselves, and they're working on replacing it. And it does have support for backing up straight to a next cloud server, but that, that part specifically is broken. I've tried it. And most apps don't even let you back up its data. Like it's Specifically, it excludes itself from letting you back up its data. So like Session, Signal, SimpleXChat, those ones do not let you back up its data as like a security measure. Uh, but if you want to have like a base list of apps, like you have a bunch of apps installed, you can use that to have a backup and then import that on a new device. And the thing that you would use to back it up, you would plug in a USB stick, it would format that and use that to back up an image of your current profile. Okay. Um, since there are certain television networks streaming that uh, decide that you can only watch certain sporting events when you're in certain locations. Um, there is an Android app that will go ahead and fake out the GPS. Uh, Noah was asking about uh, whether you could fake out the sensors or not. At least on the GPS, you don't need root. It's called Fake GPS. It's by Byte, Byte REV. Um, and you can either go ahead and tell it where you, are, where you, where you want it to think you are, or you can actually go ahead and tell it, travel me there. And if your application is looking to see if you're traveling, then it goes ahead and takes that into account as well. I don't know about the other sensors. Yes, thank you for bringing that up. I, I was aware of that, um, but forgot that you can, you can spoof the GPS. 
And there is an option to actually enable that feature under developer options, I think. Uh, GPS. Nope, it's not it. Let's see. Well, it's somewhere in here. <laughs> yeah, there is. Uh, yeah, and that app use it does work. That's cool. That's awesome. I haven't tried that personally, uh, but I remember somebody telling me about the fact that you can actually spoof the GPS without root, which is pretty awesome. All the other sensors, I'm not of aware. I'm not aware of a way to do that. Uh, I don't think you can. I'm not 100% sure. But the GPS, yeah, you're right. You can. Um, <coughs> I have a. Uh, Piggybacking off that question a little bit, uh, I use, uh, since I don't have a Google Pixel, I use um, EOS by Marina. Um, it's based off Lineage OS, and that has uh, location spoofing and um, tracker blocking, but it doesn't do any sandboxing, sadly, because it, um, well, it doesn't do any sandboxing because um, it sacrificed a little bit on convenience. Um, but um EOS is basically a good um is a good uh alternative if you if, if like you're trying to give like a Google phone to like your parents or like relatives so and, and if you don't have a Google Pixel yeah there are there are like there's a decent amount of like alternatives to using stock Android. Like there's EOS, there's Divest OS, there's Calyx OS, and then there's regular Lineage. Um, all of those, for the most part, are an improvement over stock Android, as long as it's not taking away from the security. Which is why, even on a Samsung device, I wouldn't. Even if I could, I wouldn't use a custom ROM anymore. I used to. I used to have a Galaxy S10, and it had Lineage OS on it, but that was terribly insecure because. Completely unlocked bootloader, and I had it rooted, which is required to get it to work. So I, I wouldn't do that nowadays. Uh, but it, on a Pixel specifically, which lets you do the custom keys to lock the bootloader, uh, even if even if not using Graphene OS, all those others are still an improvement. But the reality is, and this is why I choose Graphene OS, is that Graphene OS actually goes out of its way to not just be degoogled, but then actually harden the operating system and give you extra privacy features. And Graphene OS, by doing this, it removes entire classes of potential exploits that could be done. And there's been several cases in the past where there was something, there was, there was a vulnerability, there's a bug on regular Android, but Graphene OS was unaffected. And there's also cases where Graphene OS was affected, but they got the patches in before even Google did on their own operating system. So that's, that's personally why I choose Graphene OS, but there are a lot of other choices that do exist and like are an option if you want something like that. Are you aware of any uh, case studies of anybody trying to forensically interrogate the phone and what the outcomes of those were? I have not looked into that. Sp that is that is really cool. I, I've, I've seen instances of like law enforcement doing that, but I haven't looked into any specific cases of like what they were able to get out of it. And so that's. But, but what I do know is that there is a potential that if your phone is on, even if the profile is, is locked, your phone is on, you've, you've been using it recently, there is a chance that forensics could be done on the memory. Uh, but by using the auto-reboot feature or forcing it, forcing your phone to reboot, uh, there's nothing will be open and everything will be encrypted at rest. Any other questions? Uh, I have one. Uh, okay. So if, if, if I actually went and did this, not being a par I'm really not that paranoid about Google, but uh, if I went and did this, what, what would I see that would be bad for me? <laughs> I guess, wh what would be the big downside that I would run into it, you know, two weeks in or something? I guess, I guess the, biggest, the biggest hurdle and the main downside is is probably the the migration and making sure that you back your stuff up because you don't have uh, at least initially you don't have like Google Drive Google Photos to automatically back up your stuff now if you still want to use that you can you totally can on my Pixel 7 here 
I have a bunch of Google apps because some of the Google apps do work better. For instance, the Google Camera app is far superior at taking pictures than the built-in Graphene OS one, and that's just because they have the proprietary algorithms and the APIs and stuff. However, I disabled network permission, so because I don't trust Google not sending my photos or whatever. So, uh, however, like I also have the Google Photos app, and for me, I have the network disabled. But if you wanted to, you could enable the network permission for Google Photos app, and you could sign into your Google account, and it, it would do the same thing like it does on regular Android. So if you want to be more comfortable in knowing your data will always be like accessible, or you, you just want to use the Google services, then you still can use most of that. There are some things that you can't, like Google Wallet, NFC payments, that's never going to work. That requires some specific, um, some specific setup that only Google wor has with uh, like Visa, MasterCard, and stuff. So that's not going to work. But things like you want to do, you know, backups with a Google Drive. You want to do Google Photo backups. You want to use the Play Store. You want to use the Google Games app. Stuff like that. That'll work if it's app-based. Normally, it will work. If it's something that's built into the system, uh, they probably would have had to build in compatibility for it. After having said that, does any of the NFC apps work? Like, say, you wanted to use it to clone the card to get into your room? Yes, NFC does work entirely. Uh, the reason why the Google Wallet payment NFC doesn't work is because it requires some specific, uh, I don't remember exactly how it works, but it requires some specific proprietary software on the, the yes, the hardware works completely. I use NFC with like my YubiKey and it, it just works. Um, how's wearable support? Unfortunately, Google Wear does not work. What is that? I don't even know. <laughs> it's a watch. Oh. Let's that up. I would also like to point out um, that one feature enabled by the Sandbox Google Play uh, is the use of eSIMs. So eSIMs have become super popular over physical SIMs, which I don't like them because it, it becomes hard to move from phone to phone. But if your carrier requires you to use an eSIM now or you want to use one, like separately from this physical SIM, you can use both at the same time. Uh, by installing Google Play services, it has this toggle here and it's disabled by default because it requires some proprietary software in order to enable and disable an eSIM. So if I enable this, I get a new option up here. And if I p take it out of airplane mode, I get a new option to, let's see. Should give, oh, there we go, it's right there, Sims. There we go. It now lets me add an eSIM, and this, uses, this, is this requires a proprietary Google app, unfortunately. Uh, but what's cool is that it only requires this for the time that you want to install, enable, or disable an eSIM. Any other time, you can just go in here and you can turn that off, and the eSIM will still work just fine. But if you want to add a new one or if you want to disable that eSIM, you have to turn that back on. Are there any built-in features to handle things like if I'm coerced to unlock the phone? Yes. Or something like that? Okay. Yeah, so there's this really awesome feature. This, someone can correct you, maybe if I'm wrong, this might be on stock Android, but if you hold on the power button, it's got this one called lockdown, and by doing that, it prevents you from using the fingerprint. And the fingerprint is not working anymore. You have to use the pin now. So if you're in a situation where you're like, someone might try to use my finger, unauthorized to get to my phone. You can, you can just instantly do that and it'll prevent you from using the fingerprint. What's the difference between lockdown mode and the feature that you referenced where it restarts and encrypted? Does lockdown not re-encrypt the phone? No, lockdown mode does not shut down your profile. Uh, it just prevents the use of certain features. Like I think it also prevents like answering phone calls and doesn't let you use the the fingerprint. That's the main one is that it doesn't do fingerprint, but it doesn't well do the whole re-encryption thing. The only way to do that is if you reboot the phone. Now, if you wanted the very quick ability to lock a profile, 
you could use multiple profiles and this is something that even exists on stock Android. I don't know if most people know about this, but if you go into system or settings, system, multiple users, you turn this on, this lets you add multiple profiles to your phone that are all isolated from each other. And Graphene OS extends on this by taking the stock like three or four profiles and lets you do up to 32 if I remember correctly. And so if you add a user here, you can give it a name. Okay. And it creates that new user. And I can switch to it. See, I can, this is also, some of this is specific to Graphene OS. So it lets you install apps that already exist in this profile on the new one. You can turn on or revoke phone calls, SMS. You can disallow installing apps. You can disallow installing apps from third party sources. So if I switch to this, it'll make me go through the quick setup, which I'll just skip through most of it here. Oh, and it killed the, uh, if I just skip all this, blah, blah, blah. I can probably get to show up again. Let's see. That's how isolated it is. It's probably got different debugging keys. No, it doesn't. Okay, there we go. So now I'm in a different profile. And if you want that quick ability to be able to just like close your profile, encrypt everything, if you hold down the power button, you can tap end session if you're in a different profile that's not the owner profile. And now that profile is closed out. It's, it's got the same encryption at rest. Uh, the reason why it doesn't work for the owner profile is because of just the owner profiles required for everything else on the system. And the owner profile has to be unlocked before any of the profiles can be unlocked. But if you want to have that ability, you can use a separate profile. You're just going to be missing some things like you won't have certain settings that you can change. Like you won't have a lot of the network settings. Some of that will be disabled. You won't have developer options on a separate profile. But you can still do most things like user apps and all that. So when you do that and you move into the second profile, can you keep the owner profile locked? Like say you want to hand this to your child. Here, here's your profile you're allowed to play, but don't get into daddy's profile. Is there any way you can stop them from getting in? Like pin code, thumbprint? Yes, something? so it does, while you can't like force shut down the owner profile while the system's running, it's when I switch to another one and I switch back, you, it's going to close again. Is it? Oh, no, it didn't do it. Okay. Uh, and I'll, if I want to, let's say I want to end this one now. End session. So now it's locked. Now it's locked. It's now it requires a pin. Yep, every time you switch between profiles, it requires an unlock again. Unfortunately not. It requires the owner profile to be unlocked for because when you unlock the, the owner profile, it gives it the ability to unlock the keys for all the other ones. So unfortunately, it's tied to the owner profile, which is technically the administrator profile. Android 14 looks like it might add the ability to make m multiple users have administrator, uh, but we'll see what happens with that. Quick question. With the multiple eSIMs, does that mean you have multiple telephone numbers going to that phone? You can. If you want that, you can. So, for instance, on my Pixel 7, uh, for a short period of time, I had a regular SIM and I also had an eSIM. And the eSIM was data only, uh, but the regular SIM had a phone number and I could like switch between the data for either of those and I could still get all the texts and phone calls from my regular SIM just fine. But if you wanted to, you can have like an eSIM for work and then you can have one physical SIM for like home and you can have those both running at the same time. Uh, just one eSIM or multiples? Uh, I believe you can, I think, that, that's, that's pretty good. I think right now it's just one. You might be able to use multiple. Uh, don't quote me on that. I'm not 100% sure. I know in the future, at the very least, if it's not supported now, it will be supported soon, having multiple eSIMs. Thank you. Kind of a little bit of a sidebar, but how are you getting the phone on your computer? So there's this really cool tool that's really hard to pronounce. It's called SCRCPY, it's like Skirspy. Uh, it's on GitHub, and it uses the, the Android debug bridge to send a stream of the screen. Uh, and it's secure too, so like when I swipe up to do the unlock, it's black. And so it doesn't show my pin when I'm typing it in. And that's a built-in Android security feature. So if you're like doing anything that requires authentication or whatever, it makes Can you it spell that again. Uh, S S C R C P Y. 
Super awesome tool. It requires uh, debugging to be on, which you have to turn on from the developer options. So if you have USB debugging, that has to be on for this to work. Um, since he asked an unrelated question, I'll ask an unrelated question. Oh. I think like you would be the person <laughs> to know. Um, but uh, don't worry if, if, if there's no such thing. Do you know of a way to use your Linux laptop as a hands-free headset for your phone so you can take calls on your headset? Ooh, um, is that possible? Yes. Yes, I believe it is. I have played around with that a little bit before. If you, you can actually just connect your phone through Bluetooth to your laptop, and it will, I don't know if it's going to work right now. I don't have any like calls coming in or anything. But it will let you pass the audio over to your desktop, basically. And I don't know if I tried calls specifically, but I'm pretty sure you could use it like that if you wanted to. Oh, are you talking about in relation to the Skirsby app? KD Connect might do that. I haven't tried it though. Uh, but if you want to use like Skirsby, like to like if you if you just want to have like your phone on your computer, you can use Skirsby, and it'll pass through the audio. I haven't tried microphone with it yet because like if I play music on my phone and I'm connected with Skirsby, it'll play on my desktop instead. And it's very very low latency because it's wired. I haven't tried microphone yet, but that might work. That'd be a good thing to try. Let's see. I can completely control this from my. Uh, my desktop here. I'm not even touching my phone. I'm just doing it from my laptop. S S C R C P Y. Oh yeah, screen copy. Yeah, that's probably what they wanted it to be called. You could do a talk just on fun things to do with your Android phone. I mean, oh yeah, totally. I, you totally. should think about that. <laughs> Any other questions? I have one. So I, I read through the site, and it's all Pixel devices only. And you had said that there's no chance of, at anything outside of Pixel, and like. Moto is kind of the poor man's pixel as far as I'm concerned. So and any any chances at the Moto lines of phones? Probably not. Motorola has subpar hardware. And if, if there was another phone... Like I said, poor man's <laughs> pixel? <laughs> yeah. I, I said that in my... <laughs> uh, not in relation to necessarily it being a bad phone, but just in terms of security. Now, if there was another phone that had similar requirements as the pixel and was as open as the pixel, they would... They would probably be interested in pursuing that, but unfortunately, there's not. And the Pixel might look like it has a high price tag, especially if you're looking at the new ones. But right now, if you want to buy a used Pixel 6a, which is the the budget Pixel 6, you still got the new Tensor hardware. You still have you got one? Nice. You still have I think four and a half, four to four and a half years of security support. You can get that for like. 250 300 if you get one like new like on an offhand market and so if you want to get into graphing us but want like a newer phone that'll be supported longer you could totally look at getting a pixel 6a or even a pixel 6 they're really cheap now there you go there you go <laughs> 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 Yeah, we'll do it right now. <laughs> I've, got a, I've, got a, I've got a son at home that will probably do this on his son. So. Um, piggybacking off um, Nate's question, uh, um, my mom, my mom's son is a Motorola phone, and that runs um, e EOS on there, and it's, it works well for her, but um, she has some problems because she didn't know how to use a smartphone, so... <laughs> That's cool that those work on the Motorola's. I didn't know those do. Yeah, if you have something like a Moto, like you could probably do something like EOS or maybe Lineage, which could potentially be better, uh, but you might be missing some important security stuff like being able to lock the bootloader. It depends on the phone. You good? Uh, okay, there you go.
you uh, hinted earlier when we were talking about the backup about integration into NextCloud. Is there any foreseeable future plans to integrate more features into people who self-host? So they are currently, because that NextCloud thing, I've tried it, it's terribly broken. It like kind of works if you can get it to work. It's, it's pretty messy. Uh, they're, they're planning on doing a whole rewrite of that backup system, uh, but I don't know any specific plans about that uh, in the, the short term. I know in the long term they're going to redo it, but I'm not sure about supporting any extra external systems yet. I imagine if they were to rewrite it, they would probably make it like actually work with NextCloud properly. And you were showing the, the Google Services Sandbox, and is there any, any future plans to support the Micro-G project? So this, is, this was built as an alternative to Micro-G because Micro-G requires signature spoofing, which is kind of a dangerous thing to have enabled because it has to spoof the fact that it's not actually Google Play services. Uh, Graphene OS uses real Google Play services straight from Google, and so they don't have to do any signature spoofing, and you know that you're getting you're not getting any kind of sketchy software or anything because while I don't trust Google in terms of like, you know, having my data or whatever, they are extremely good with security. And so you're getting the play services from Google itself because Micro-G is like modified project and stuff. And on most distros like Calyx, in order to have Micro-G, in order for it to work, it has to be highly privileged. And so you're trusting that it's not going to misuse that highly privileged state, whereas the Google Play services, which is using the real one, right, is sandboxed. So it, you know that it doesn't instead of trusting something else. So it's, it's placing your trust in a, different, in a different place, basically. But I personally prefer the sandbox method because I think it works better and allows you at any given time to just uninstall all, the, all, all those app apps, apps if you want to. You don't even have to have them. You can just, I can just go in here. Uh, and in order to remove this, you just go into the apps. You can just go here, you can uninstall, uninstall Play Store, and you can do that for each of those and just uninstalls them just like that. So Pixel 6 is the recommended, but it'll run on 5, 4, 3. What is the downside to running, like say, on a Pixel 5a? So Graphene OS follows the Google release and support cycle because Google's the one who releases the main security patches, and they don't want to s like su officially support a phone that's not being supported with security releases and security patches because of the whole point of it being secure. And so if you go to this site, it's end, end of life date. This is a really helpful site for showing you the, the support life cycle for tons of stuff. And if I go to, I think, Pixel, yeah, Google Pixel. So it's, it is currently supported on a 4A 5G and a 5, but as you can see, security guaranteed security updates ends in four months. So that is when Graphene OS ends its guaranteed updates too. Now they will do some, uh, if they have time, like for the Pixel 3, they did some quality of life updates, some, some long-term support updates, even after it was officially unsupported by Google, but that's not a guarantee whatsoever, and you're not going to be getting a new version of Android. So... The main, the main thing about using getting a, a newer one is that you're going to get the maximum lifespan. And even if you got like a, a 5A, which is still newer, you're only looking at about a year and two months of security updates guaranteed. So just by getting a newer one, like if you went ahead and just got the Pixel 6A, you have four whole years like that. And it's so much better of a phone at this point for like the price. It doesn't really make a lot of sense to get a 5A because the 5A and the 5 and the 4A 5G use a very budget Qualcomm processor. But if you just go for the 6A, which is still really cheap, like you can go in for two, 250, uh, it'll have that tensor chip. So it'll be a much better experience for a longer time. You mentioned that the... Um Google Play services are sandboxed. Can you give a little bit more information as far as like what that actually means? So on stock Android, or like even Samsung, the Google Play services are, they run in a separate SE Linux domain, which is like a, like rules that it has against it for what it can access, what it can do. And on stock Android, I don't know everything it can access, but I know it can access like a lot of device identifiers that m regular apps cannot, and that's why the eSIM app requires Google Play services uh, because it's it needs that it needs it. Sorry. Sandboxing just lets you basically give 
Yeah, so it prevents it prevents play services from accessing those identifiers that it normally would have on stock Android. And it doesn't have any it doesn't have any access to anything that a normal app doesn't on Graphene OS. And if you go into 